Today we have the pleasure of meeting Professor van den Berg from Groningen in Holland. Uh, he has been involved in urban and regional planning problems, director of the, one of the directors of the Provincial Physical Planning agency. Unit agency, agency in Northern Holland. Um, <coughs> he has taken a great interest in Ireland, particularly since 1974. He has been bringing students here. And it was a marvelous coincidence that we both found ourselves here at University College Cork, an opportunity I just couldn't miss. Today I hope we'll discover something of the development of his thought and practice and hear more about this philosophy which would be very interesting for Ireland. A philosophy of planning which really tries to get people involved creatively and responsibly in the design of their own environments. A philosophy which I think is summed up in the title of his most recent book, A Place for Everyone Under the Sun. Right? With a with a question mark. With yes. a question mark. Right. So let's begin at the beginning. How come you got interested in geography in the first place? Well, as most people, I think something happens in your boyhood. And uh, so it did to me. And I, I was um, uh, enforced to stay at home for a long time. I couldn't go to um, the school and things like that. When I was six, and my father said, you should do something. And I had a big big box with uh, stamps, uh -huh. post stamps. And he collected for me. So I started to collect post stamps. And uh, that makes uh, someone interested in uh, what's on the stamps. Uh, figures, portraits of people, presidents or, or kings or something like, but also landscapes. And sometimes a map on a, I remember a map of a, I mean the, uh, the canal zone in uh, in Panama. Panama. Yes. I remember that uh, that stamp, and so I became interested. I started to compare. Now, comparison is one of the basic uh, techniques in geography. Yes. So later on, I uh, I understood how important it has been to me that I started to compare when I was really young hmm. to learn myself how to compare. And another aspect is that on stamps you find the whole history of a country. Uh, let's say, uh, stamped with the term occupated a territory uh -huh. by German troops or by British troops or anywhere, and then you know, something has happened, what's done? Then the word revolution. Uh -huh. Or uh, uh, on German uh, stamps the, the term uh, Freistaat, uh, as uh, Ireland has been a free, free state. Uh, so something happened, and uh, I became interested what it was that happened and how it could have happened. That's an interest in history. And uh, so I, later on, I had a, an interest combined of history and geography. And you know, they are twin sciences. Yes, yes. In his, historically speaking, they are twin sciences. They cannot without each other, mm -hmm. in fact. And that is a, a truth I still uh, feel is very important for a geographer who has become a planner. Because a planner is someone who is making history. Uh -huh. But uh, when you don't know uh, what history is, what it is about, you cannot become a good planner. Mm -hmm. You cannot. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy that I had a double education in geography and in history. As a matter of fact, when I started my academic study in U National University of Utrecht in the Netherlands, I had to make the choice what should be the main subject and what the minor. Mm -hmm. and, um, I had very difficulty to make the choice. So I went to both professors, I had a discussion before I started my study, and then he said, oh, come to the institute and start your study. Within some weeks you will know what you, uh, what you prefer. This was Professor Van Vuren? Van Vuren was the geographer, <coughs> and uh, the professor in ancient history, Bolkestein, was the other one. And uh, so I started to, to listen to the lectures and to do something. And within a one month, within four weeks, I knew emotionally, I couldn't uh, argument it rationally, but it was emotionally, that geography would be my preference. Uh -huh. I think it was because uh, you are meeting other people. You have to, to travel. Mm -hmm. And uh, that uh, is... Uh, easier to do it as a geographer in space. 
mm. than to travel in time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see what yes, I mean? Yes. You understand what I mean? Yeah. And when you are a young boy, a uh, preference for history is something that cannot be realized before you have become an, ex an experienced man uh -huh. who have had a history of his own. Uh -huh. yes. You see, when you have a, an own history, you can study history. You can understand what's going on looking back yes. and looking forward. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I started with geography. And as a matter of fact, I was impressed by physical geography. Mm. But that was uh, not that mathematized mm. as it is now. Yes. And it was not uh, a kind of physics mm -hmm. or a kind of uh, chemistry as it is now. So would it have been William Morris Davis or yes, Pink? Yes, type geomorphology. geomorphology. Yes. And that's interesting. Oh, fascinating. How such forms in the landscape could be explained oh. as a, a historical product of, yes. of nature and man, most times alone of nature. Yes. Only of nature. But then I. I understood that man did also something, reshaping natural environment into built environment and well arranged environment in order to get uh, to get a living from it, and then uh, to uh, to make some industry and uh, export to other countries. So the commercial aspects of geography, and then I was uh, lectures by Professor van Vuren on uh, development. The, the uh, the, uh, the, voy uh, the traveling over the seas to the exploration, exploration of the yes. earth. Yes. And then um, that is very interesting to, to hear about that because then I understood that commerce is following exploration. Yes. And religion is following commerce. Uh -huh. So I understood the significance of human uh, cultural anthropology. Uh, cultural anthropology is about the change of faith, the change of uh, uh, values, the change of social structures under influence of, uh, of invasions or mm. contact with, uh, with other mm. people. And uh, that was the base for understanding the role of sociology in society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because a society is well structured mm -hmm. in some way, formally or informally, and the structure has been uh, op um, institutionalized or mm. it has not been institutionalized and when you are planning in a small mm. community the problem is that uh, the social structure is not formalized it is informal mm -hmm. so you can you are coming into a structure you don't mm. know how it is and mm -hmm. you can't be informed about that mm. because it's very personal Mm -hmm. uh, for everybody who is a member of that mm -hmm. uh, community. But when you have a large community, <coughs> you need cultural anthropology mm -hmm. and sociology. When it is a small community, you, know, you need psychology. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you'll see planning. I've come to the planning field from geography and from history, but it has broadened my view and I have uh, uh, experienced that we need the uh, the, the, uh, the knowledge from civil, uh, a whole range of other yes, disciplines yes. to understand yes. what's going on and how to make plans. Yes. yes. So I take it your curiosity was first awakened through world concerns, yes. uh, far away places, friendly and hostile mm. and so on. And then in your education, you started immediately thinking of world systems of mm. commerce, exploration, mm. missionaries, and so on. So <clears throat> unlike many, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> architects and, and uh, planners who come from different traditions, uh, you do not begin first with the local site and then go out. You begin with the bigger one and then come back in. Mm. But now many of the students who were studying with you at that time under Van Vuren were not uh, all involved in planning or applied interests. Mm. Can you tell me how that switch occurred? Because I sense you're very anxious to speak about that. Hmm? Well, uh, most of the students uh, had the perspective to become a teacher in geography in secondary schools. <coughs> and I myself had been educated as such to become a teacher. Yes. And we were told, well, you have an academic study, and when you have been nominated as a teacher, then you start, you make your book, mm -hmm. the book in order to become a teacher. Yes. You should not do that at the university, because it's a waste of your time. You should, think, you should learn to think, to discuss, but not to produce a kind of, uh, well, uh, general, uh, general educational uh, 
uh, picture of the world and things that you can do that. And you have an atlas and you have an encyclopedia. So you yeah, no problems to find facts. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's an institute that you can get your, your, your dias, your, uh, your uh, pictures <coughs> to, to project. You can hire them there. So you don't need to, to make them yourself. They're quite simple to do. But um, uh, most of those people were interested in the world and in continental affairs. You know, the second half of the 30s was right the year, but the period where the Germans uh, re to, uh, re tried to re-get their power, their political power. So we were uh, concentrated either on Europe, Western Europe, the problems around Germany, or we were interested in, and you can understand what that means, the Dutch East Indies, yes. our colony. Yeah. And especially the main colony, the Dutch East Indies, now is Indonesia. So, uh, some of us were interested in America, but you, it was impossible to go to America. Mm. You cannot understand the big change since, since the 30s. Yes. Now in the 80s, every student has gone to the States. If not, he's not, hasn't been a real student. <laughs> yes. And at least one or, once or twice he has paid some visit behind the Iron Curtain. Yes. And uh, very clever students manages to go into China. Uh -huh. But then he has seen the whole of the world. There's nothing behind only the, uh, the, uh, the Pacific Ocean. Oh. And that's, uh, you know, that's a kind of uh, drowned, uh, drowned row of, uh, of falcons, yes. uh, nothing more. So you only see the tops of the falcons. Um, oh, that's the area where you have the nuclear bombs. And yes. So to try them out. Not interesting to go there. But uh, that time, uh, European <coughs> affairs, colonial affairs, were the main subjects and uh, of interest. And uh, suddenly, after I got my master's degree, I was invited by the professor to go to a place to do local work. And uh, I didn't feel, feel trained about that uh, for that job. But he said, I will supervise you and your colleague, that's Christian van Passen, my mm -hmm. friend, mm -hmm. who arrived at the university the same date as I did. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so we together were sent to Middelburg on the island of Walcheren in the province of Zeeland. And there we had to study the problems of urban extension of Flushing in the direction of Middelburg. And in between those towns was a small uh, airport, mm -hmm. a regional airport. And as a matter of fact, you cannot build up until the airport. You have to keep distance from that. So. Uh, Flushing couldn't be expanded anymore. There was a canal from Flushing, and the east of Flushing to Middleburg. There was the railway line, and on the other side you had the dunes and the rural areas, and uh, you had the airport. So Flushing was a kind of captive city, uh -huh. and we had to to study and analyze analyze this situation in order to find a solution for the city of Flushing. Well, we we made that analyze, and it was interesting. To, to have that experience because uh, the main problems of fishing are not space problems, not spatial problems, but are economic problems. The economic structure of the city uh, is very interesting. The main job opportunities were in the shipyard. Mm -hmm. It's still there. A very old shipyard has already been there in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. It has remained there, has not been modernized, has become a modern industry. But they have the lowest level of wages in the Netherlands in mm -hmm. shipbuilding. So every people, every uh, group of people who have been trained in that shipyard to be become a skilled laborer in shipyard work, they will be bought away uh, by the bigger shipyards in the in Rotterdam or the Amsterdam area who are pay which are paying higher wages. So we said uh, it is a kind of competition between the uh, the uh, shipyards in the Netherlands, and this shipyard in Flushing had only a future when the, uh, the big differences in local wages will remain in the country, and we didn't expect that, mm -hmm. because that's not the policy of the trade unions. Mm -hmm. They don't want to have the, mm. the, such a big difference. And when the, the big difference would, uh, would uh, go away, would be diminished, and. Uh, uh, then the end would be that the competition wouldn't be uh, possible for that uh, yard. So 
then the main job opportunities of fishing would collapse and the city wouldn't need any expansion anymore. Mm -hmm. That was our, our product. And uh, then uh, we brought the report to the professor because he sh had to approve it before it would, could be published and hand it over to the authorities who had asked for it. And they said, that's a good analysis, but the conclusions are not fair. Uh -huh. The only thing that should be done is not to speculate about wage levels, but to displace the airport to another place in Zeeland. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he was right. And he dictated the conclusions. So the, the conclusions report were not ours. No. We were not experienced enough to see it. We were very young people. And only an experienced man, like a professor, and he was in mm. his 70, in, in his 60s, late 60s then, he said, yes, uh, you need some experience to, to make conclusions. And that's very important for me. When I, later on, I became more involved, more and more involved in physical planning problems. And uh, I had the advantage to be uh, head of the research department in the most important province we have, the province of Northern Holland, the province where the national <coughs> capital, Amsterdam, is lying. And uh, yeah, very interesting problems there. In fact, all the problems of the Netherlands you have in a small scale in the province of Northern Holland. Mm -hmm. So a very variable job I had and uh, with many aspects. But I was the only expert and he was really young, uh -huh. Uh -huh. under 30. My goodness. So I developed very fast uh -huh. and I got my experience. I made many mistakes and um, my colleagues, especially my technical colleagues, who uh, enlarged my scope of view uh, considerably in another way than uh, the people who came from other mm -hmm. disciplines, I mean social disciplines, social mm -hmm. sciences, this, uh, the, the, uh, the architects and the civil engineering were looking at uh, the spatial problems in quite another way. And uh, they mm -hmm. said, uh, we can change the whole of the environment if we want, and if you pay, if you are prepared to pay for it, we can change it, make it in a kind of paradise, mm -hmm. but reshape it. But it costs a lot of money. And uh, it's your job to uh, invent whether the people are uh, inclined to do that and what, what things they, they want to have and want to pay for. So I understood that engineering has something to do with social manipulation or uh, fosters more social consciousness about, uh, of people ab uh, about their future and their environment in their, fu uh, their future in their environment. So they, uh, that opened my mind for the core of the planological problems. The planning, the planning as a social process, mm -hmm. uh, going about uh, how things and where things should be built and where not. Mm. but also about community organization and community development. Mm. Mm. And planning as a rational process done by technicians and bureaucrats, mm. or planning done by politicians, or even by the people themselves, by what we call, call, could call a, a common command of all actors, all kind of actors in the area, of, in, to remold their own uh, environment with the eye on their own future mm -hmm. and the competition with other areas, other, mm -hmm. other regions, other nations, other, other continents. That's a very important thing mm -hmm. that uh, I learned. And then the last uh, thing I uh, experienced that uh, it's not only building, not only community development, it's not only rational planning, it's also emotional planning, intuitional planning, and what's the most important, it is a kind of learning. A kind of learning. A kind of learning. Yes. And now looking back at the whole of my mm. experience in practice, I think that the most important uh, thing I found was, was the learning process. Mm. Mm. Uh, that's the, the motor, mm -hmm. and that's also uh, the, the process that's dictating the speed you can uh, reach with the planning process and uh, it has to do with, uh, with uh, the fight 
against the alienation of the people mm -hmm. as to their environment and the building processes. You know, mm. it's enacted in the Netherlands. It's forbidden to build, except with what you call planning permission. Mm -hmm. But that's no, not the only um, uh, constraint for do-it-yourself activities. The other constraint is that the building industry is rather well organized. And what's more, the building trade union is very well organized. Mm -hmm. So those people say it's our job to do the building. And at the moment, uh, there is a, 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 a process going on in the Netherlands from the government, backed by parliament, uh, to urge the local authorities, the municipalities, to make a local bylaw that it is forbidden to do it yourself in order to, uh, well, to, to make uh, employment in the building industry that has already gone down with about 50%, 50% is half of it is, or has remained and the other mm. people have become mm. unemployed. They want, as a matter of fact, they want those people re-employed again. So do it yourself in uh, uh, improving your house or in cleaning it up, in, in, in keeping it up, in maintenance is, uh, now it's not yet forbidden, it hasn't yet been forbidden by any municipality, but it's coming. Mm. You'll see. Mm. And the opposition also is growing against it, <coughs> as a matter of fact. Yes. Because people can't afford mm. the wages in the building industry at the mm. high. Yes. It seems to me that, that you're dealing with, with such gross incompatibilities here. Uh, to go back to the story of your professor who said, uh, your analysis is fine, but your conclusion is wrong. We ought to pick that airport and plunk it somewhere else. It seems to me that that illustrates a certain what one might call a fascistic element to physical planning. The macro decisions about the location of an airport, for example, or a factory, or so on, mm -hmm. uh, that are quite independent of any sensitive analysis of local conditions, mm -hmm. in local conditions terms, okay? Uh, so, now, how to reconcile that, what I call, I'm, I'm exaggerating, calling it a fascistic element, a sort of an mm -hmm. imperial decision about major physical plant, and this other side of getting people to feel responsible and effective in being involved in planning their own environments. It seemed to me you're, you're dealing with an incompatibility. Mm -hmm. Because if, suppose people come to the conclusion, we don't want a nuclear plant here, we don't want mm -hmm. an airport here, and so on, and that has come through this process of community building, you have to deny it on other grounds. How, how have you resolved that? How have you lived with that tension in mm. your work? You see, the, the conflict is between the influence from outside and the ideas from the people by the people themselves. That's the <coughs> internal view on it. And in a densely populated country of the Netherlands, there are always uh, strong influence from out, influences from outside. Uh, from the national government or from the the, the uh, conurbations on the rural areas mm. and and so on. So on Walcheren, the island of Walcheren, the people of Flushing said uh, that airport has been realized there uh, by an external influence mm -hmm. and we can't do anything against it. Mm -hmm. So we have to accept and we have to adapt ourselves to the situation. Then we said, yes, but there's another external influence. That's the wage problem mm -hmm. between those, uh, those shipyards. And you cannot uh, control that either. So you have to accept the, mo uh, the decision they will take, that you have th the workers here will have to be paid the same wages as the people in Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. And then you will have to close the shipyard. And uh, if that's done, you see, that external influence okay. are deciding about your future. Mm -hmm. So what the professor said was just the, not uh, strengthening the external influence, but taking it away. And say, displace it to another uh, yes. area where there is more space. Yes. Then yes. you can have your airport. Yes. And such a situation is, uh, was uh, available. 
And when you look at the original plan for Zeeland, you will see that the, the old airport has been taken away. Mm. And there is on the map the place for the new airport. It hasn't been built. It yet. hasn't been constructed mm -hmm. because it's only for uh, for <coughs> tourist mm. uh, planes, and mm. it's much too expensive to build such a thing. Construct such a thing for tourists alone. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you understand what I mean? And uh, it is a conflict, and uh, we have learned to live with the situation that uh, we should defend ourselves against influence from outside. Mm -hmm. I think it's a kind of self-determination, and you know that's an old uh, doctrine from the Second World War. After the Second World War, we have reshaped Europe yes. uh, after the principles of self-determination, uh, political self-determination, and the decolonization of the world after the Second World War had followed the same lines. Mm. Uh, it's interesting to say that uh, uh, now the political structures of society uh, that is a larger scale. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the fight to to get more control over your own situation, as a kind of answer to mm -hmm. that challenge, mm -hmm. and also as a kind of precondition for accepting the larger scale structures, yes. is uh, is quite natural. Mm -hmm. And in the planning field, you have the same. Mm -hmm. For instance, the problem: should planning be centralized at the national level? national governmental level, or not. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Netherlands, is, it is enacted since 1901, so it is more than 80 years now, that the main planning policy-making level is the municipality. Uh -huh. Provincial government has to coordinate mm -hmm. all those initiatives at the local level, and uh, uh, has to, to steer a little that, if possible. They have no, no much uh, powers to do that, but in any case, they have the power that, they, that all uh, local uh, expenditure of local government has to be approved by provincial government. So that's an instrument to steer what's going on and actually mm -hmm. is going on. And factually, will be realized about the plans. But then um, they can uh, uh, correct the national, the local level, local pl physical planning level, by uh, conceiving regional mm. physical planning. And uh, at the national level, that's, uh, there's much, there's no much power to, to uh, create a national physical plan. We have uh, thrown that out of our act in 1962. So it's not feasible to make a national physical plan. But what you can do is to, uh, to um, conceive a kind of a national physical planning policy mm -hmm. in great lines. And uh, that should be uh, composed out of the sector planning programs of the civil department. Yes. And they should be, uh, well, a kind, uh, integrated uh, in the sense that for all those sector programs should be uh, indicated the place where it should be realized. That's to the main, the trusses of the motorways, for instance, uh -huh. and the railway lines, the canals, and uh, the, uh, uh, the big industrial estates, and where the harbors should be developed and where not, uh -huh. and so on. And also about uh, uh, the spreading of the, the distribution of educational facilities over the country and so on. And uh, that has been done, but uh, at the moment we see that Parliament is unable to make that integration at the national level. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has an interesting mm. cause. The cause, in fact, is that every minister is responsible to Parliament personally. Uh -huh. And uh, so Parliament can uh, dis discuss all the physical planning problems, but at a certain moment from some region, uh, an authority is asking Parliament, would you mind, would you mind to be kind and, and order the minister to do something yes. we want? And uh, there's a discussion in Parliament, and uh, there's a vote. And then the minister is saying, yes, I will do that. But it's against the, the physical planning <laughs> policy. But he will do. So that is an, 
That's an incompatibility. Okay. That is something that cannot be reconciled. Mm. And uh, we have uh, made this conclusion out of that, that the best level to integrate the sector planning programs in a kind of a physical planning structure is the level of the regional plan. So the power to do the integration if is given to the provincial government. Provincial. Right. Yes. Uh -huh. And I think in a country like Ireland that's yes. so heavily concentrated, mm. uh, as the power sector has so heavily mm. been heavily, uh, has been concentrated so heavily mm. and so strongly in the capital in Dublin, yes. uh, the only way to uh, to get a more fluently physical planning policy mm -hmm. is to create provinces. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Not the old ones, but new ones. The Buchanan and, and ones. Empower them. Would you like the Buchanan ones? Pardon? Would you like the Buchanan regions? Yes. Or has, is it not yet defined? No, right? not yet defined. Yeah. In the Netherlands we say every uh, urban um, covered conurbation and this rural area around it should become a province in order the province could plan the whole development, balanced development between yes. urban and rural areas within the region. And the problem in Ireland is that there are so few urban conurbations outside uh, Dublin, Cork mm. and in Northern Ireland, Belfast. Yes. Uh, could we move to Ireland? Yes. Would that suit yes. you? I think, uh, I think we're all very curious about any lessons we can learn from experiences, analogous experiences. I think there are big problems looking for comparisons between Holland and Ireland. Even though we're neighbors, there, is a, there are vast differences of culture. And I think one of the uh, most difficult ones may be that here we do not have the same long urban tradition. Uh, mm. so that the initial approach to physical planning could hardly take the same assumptions as, say, Holland would, or a heavily urbanized area. In other words, it mightn't be uh, urban-centered. Uh, the second big problem, it seems to me, is political, the, the experience of um, political participation with regard to things environmental. But I'm just speculating. I haven't been involved. So I would like you to describe first your, your interaction with Ireland, your experience here, mm -hmm. and then uh, some lessons you think we, we could learn from Holland. The last question is a difficult question. I would, like, I would prefer to start what I learned from, Eng uh, from Ireland. Okay, and that would be nice uh, to hear. You say, uh, when we came to Ireland, we had our ideas how physical planning could be done. That was the, the Netherlands experience, perhaps a little more broad, a broader scene, you can see it, the continental experience. We knew that in Britain things were done in another way because there's another political system. But uh, as we are living in the Netherlands, like in Germany, in Belgium, in the post-Napoleon yes. uh, administrative structure of a country, we uh, we thought, we didn't think about that, we, perhaps it could be, used in, be useful to Ireland as well. But it didn't work. <coughs> and you said that might uh, be caused by difference in culture. I think you're right. Culture is uh, quite different. As far as I can understand, and I do understand, uh, every year that I'm coming in Ireland, I understand to understand less of the Irish culture. <laughs> it's so difficult to understand. I think the only thing I'm quite sure about is that I do not understand the Irish culture. That's fairly healthy stance. Yes, <laughs> and I tell myself that's because the Celtic culture and the continental culture is uh, Germanic, mm. and that makes a difference. That makes a difference in any mm. case. So I'm studying uh, the old Irish uh, history and uh, the literature, the, the poems and, and, and the sagas and legends of, uh, of Ireland in order to get a grip on it. Mm -hmm. But uh, all things that have been written about it and that I can read are written, uh, have been written in English. Uh -huh. So that is a translation. Right. It's <laughs> not the right Irish culture. I got into my hands. Mm -hmm. Well, second point, you, you second course you mentioned was the uh, urban tradition. I think uh, 
the hard core of the urban tradition is home rule. Mm -hmm. To be responsible for your own area, your urban area, uh, to, uh, to have the right of vote, uh, to, uh, for the councillors, to, to, to get your councillors, the councillors you wish, <coughs> representative government as a mm -hmm. matter of fact. But in the wards, the urban wards, you still have uh, direct democracy, people living in the street. For instance, in the lanes of Cork, mm -hmm. people living in the lanes of Cork have control about their lane. Mm -hmm. and they have a kind of uh, feel feeling that they are responsible for their lane, mm -hmm. for the that it is clean, that it is safe, and that it has a good, uh, good shape, it has a good, uh, how call it, uh, uh, cleaned and it is mm. painted and so on. It should be nice, mm -hmm. nice lane. And they are in competition with each other. So um, mm -hmm. we know the same in the Netherlands. We have uh, villages and towns where the, every year there's a festival and the prize is going to the uh, dead ward that has uh, cleaned up its, mm -hmm. its own environment in the best way mm -hmm. and painted it and so on, done some other things. That's something like the Tidy Towns competition tidy in towns, Ireland. Yes. Do you know that Glenville won that one time? Pardon? My village won that one oh, time. Oh, that's, mm -hmm. that's nice. Yeah, so you are proud of it, I think. Yes. And that's what uh, people should be. Mm -hmm. Well, that tradition of home rule we also have in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an, uh, uh, the result of uh, that we are living, more than half of the population are living on under sea level, in very low areas, and uh, the problem is to get the water out of it. So we have to pump. And we are doing that since the uh, 12th century. It have been the monks in the monasteries who have learned it to us. They have taught us to do mm. that. But uh, we have taken over power as a, in, in a sense of home rule. So everyone who has a plot of land in, uh, at, or a farm in the polder has a responsibility and all together uh, uh, can be uh, asked to go to the dikes, to defend the dikes, and that is compulsionary. So nobody can uh, say, I don't like to do, I don't go. Mm. If he doesn't go, he's losing his farm and his land, losing his property. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a very uh, strong fine, as a matter mm -hmm. of fact, uh, mm -hmm. not doing your, what you mm -hmm. should do. And uh, that's in the tradition, everybody has accepted that in the mm -hmm. lower parts and in the rural areas. So that's a kind of democracy. And at grassroots level, yes. we know already centuries uh, mm. uh, along, since, uh, since the 12th and 13th century, both in urban and in rural areas. Well, the problem in Ireland is that you have had such a thing also in your country, but the British have demolished that social and political structure, mm -hmm. especially in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. How can you get it back? Well. That's something you have to do yourself. Mm -hmm. And nobody can <coughs> tell you how to do it. Mm -hmm. Don't you think it's been happening through, say, the cooperatives in agriculture and, you That's know... That's the base. That's the base, yes. right? Yeah. That's one of the possibilities. Yes. But cooperatives are not, co not compulsory, you see. Not everybody has to be a member of, co of yes. a cooperative. And that's... That in the water questions and in the defense of a city, mm -hmm. It is compulsory to defend, mm -hmm. and from the defense has come the idea that you can also do something about development. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, physical planning is a kind of uh, expertise coming from, uh, from the general staff, from the Department of Defense. It is an invention of the <coughs> Roman, the ancient Roman yes. Empire. How mm. can you have control of your area? Mm. Well, you and see, a province, mm, yes. a province, is a part outside Italy of the Roman Empire, yes. where somebody was in charge of government on behalf of the Senate in Rome. Yes, mm. yes. You see, it's this military and tactical, uh, military tactical type uh, power origin of physical planning language and terminology that I think makes people very uninterested in it. It frightens them. I think uh, with good reason. 
you know, Foucault talks about the decline of monarchical power, but the <clears throat> persistence of this capillary type of power, the panopticon, you know, everybody is being watched. So they, you know, they would penalize if they don't, a much more effective form of control than a monarchical situation ever was. I think the reason why physical planning fails in, in many settings is because there is this association with A, military takeover, and B, being watched, you know. It seems mm -hmm. to go right against those very values of uh, democracy and home rule that you were also praising on the other hand. Yes, but with Rome, home rule, you have the same situation, you are under control. You are under control of your community. Mm -hmm. But you are a member of community and you can have a say on other people as well. Mm -hmm. So that's mutual. Mm -hmm. The control is mutual. Mm -hmm. And you are responsible and you cannot be responsible without mutual control. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a polar uh, authority, uh, every year or twice a year, the inspector who has been nominated by the democratically chosen board of the polar authority has been nominated, and there are two of them, they are coming along, along every farm, inspecting the ditches, whether they have been properly, uh, properly maintained, mm -hmm. and uh, in order that the water can go out, or can be pumped out. If not, they are ordered to do it immediately, where the inspectors are standing by, and have to pay their fine. See, and everybody has accepted that. That's a kind of control. They know that perhaps another year they can be the inspector. They can be nominated as inspector to look at the other people. That's not a problem. When the, when the power is coming from the national level, going down mm -hmm. to uh, uh, the grassroots level, then you, see, you can see it as a, a danger, something military. Mm. But when it's coming f at grassroots level, mm. and when you uh, have a kind of federal structure between the several uh, rural authorities, let's say the, the cooperatives mm. in Ireland, that they can tackle the larger and more complicated problems as well, mm. then it will not be seen and, and uh, will not be felt as a, as a military organization, mm. only as a defense organization. Mm -hmm. And I think Ireland has a long tradition of self-defense, <laughs> not formally. Mm. But informally, we haven't been but well, well organized, mm. I think uh, something, some, sometimes I think that IRA mm. is such an organization. Mm. And it would be a, a, a great pity if the experience of the IRA in uh, creating a kind of defense policy and a development policy of Ireland on a military level mm should get lost and it shouldn't be reshaped in, let's say, let's say in a civic sense to, the, uh, to do it in a political way, but from grassroots level up to the state mm -hmm. and not the other way, not upside down. Although I must recognize that there are certain things that have to be organized at the national level mm -hmm. and that the, the, the whole of the nation should be, should be behind that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, one of the tasks of the national level, one of the tasks of the national Irish parliament is to empower local people, local groups, in, in one or another kind of home rule, to look after themselves, to look after their own environment, and to bring the problems together for, uh, in a federal structure, let's say in a provincial level, that cannot be solved by the local groups alone. Let's say, the real, uh, that the uh, railway line from Sligo over Galway and Limerick to Cork, the Western Railway Line that's mm. has gone, part of it has already fully gone out of operation. And there are no thoroughway going trains even from, from Cork to, uh, to, to Galway. Mm. Yeah, yes, not, mm. no, yeah. That should be reoperationalized. Mm -hmm. Because it's very important for the development of the Western area. Right. And that's the only counterfeiting power against Dublin. Dublin is at the East Coast. Well, you should create something at the West Coast. Mm -hmm. yes. You have the airport, mm -hmm. the airport, commercial airport of Shannon, mm -hmm. and the religious airport of Fort Knox. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, nut time, you will have, well, that's okay. Yeah. That's the cultural aspect. Uh-huh. And it is the economic aspects. In Dublin, you have them in one city. So you will never get one big co- uh, conurbation in the West Coast. Mm-hmm. It will be split over and divided over several urban centers. Mm-hmm. But then you should connect them mm-hmm. with their own main road, motorway, or after Irish standards, mm-hmm. it's not a big old motorway in Britain or in Germany, but a good road. And secondly, uh, and a good accommodating in the center should have your, uh, your, uh, your rest places along the road, mm-hmm. you should have your, your uh, uh, inns along the, the road, and you should have all, uh, um, how do you call it, uh, petrol stations, things that so well equipped, and you should have your own railway line. Well, then what's to the prevent all these multinationals from coming in, these foreigners from bringing in their chain, Howard Johnson type, string along the motorway, and uh, those companies who would do it quite rationally, you know. Would that happen in Ireland no. if you did that? From that point of view, Ireland is a third world country. Mm. It's economically colonized. Yes. Mm-hmm. And they are accepting that because they think it's the only way to become a real member of the European community. Mm-hmm. They think uh, we have to be developed. Mm-hmm. We cannot master that ourselves. So it will, we will have to accept that transnationals are doing their task. And when we can get them in Ireland, that's good for Ireland. You know who is paying for that? Ireland. That's the taxpayer and that's the consumer. Mm-hmm. They are paying for that. The only good solution Ireland invented was the industrial free estate on Shannon Apple. You thought that was that's a good solution? Mm-hmm. That's good. But that's only working for experts. And you get the, the wage money mm-hmm. is brought to Ireland. So that's a good thing. And because that, that's the only free estate, industrial estate in Ireland, the firms who are there would remain longer. Mm-hmm. There. They can uh, compete with other uh, factories in the world of the same transnationals much better than the people who have, after some years, have to start to pay taxes to Ireland. Mm-hmm. And they say, no, we should stop that. Go mm-hmm. to another country with another large percentage of tax freedom. Uh-huh. Zambia. But that, that's not safe. But mm-hmm. what you can do in addition mm-hmm. to this policy is to stimulate local initiative, uh, industrial initiatives, commercial initiatives, even of a workshop type or a small shop type and uh, artistic initiatives Mm -hmm. all over the country to produce for the home market, especially for the regional market and for the tourist market, the tourists coming to this area. And uh, as the production will be uh, difficult when there is no insight in the market for those products, you need some market research. But you have already many commercial educational institutes in the western part of the country. You have the regional tech in Sligo, you have the university in Galway, you have the, the <coughs> schools, the, the tertiary level schools in, uh, in Limerick, and you have the university in Galway. Mm-hmm. All those departments could become centers of help for local initiatives and regional initiatives to do some market research. And, uh, there will be some overproduction at certain moments, and you should get rid of that in the big uh, metropolises of, uh, of the world. But that should be done directly by non-profit organizations, because that's the problem. When you are producing in the remote areas something and it should be brought to the world market, there's uh, in between an organization of, uh, of traders yes. we call and them transport, yes. and they are taking the profit. We call them Gombean men here, mm. or they used to be called that. Mm. But what is the EEC if not one giant uh, Gombean system, middleman system? Can any member of the EEC decide to go the way you're saying? Really? They have to, because they are, their, their policy is profitable to a, a, a group of uh, interest that is narrowing from day to day. You think so? The bigger institutions. Mm-hmm. get the profits. Mm-hmm. And uh, the voters are out of scope. So the smaller farmers, all those people that have become unemployed, are all the people that have been pensioned, 
all the people that are still at school mm -hmm. or in the families, they say, what's profitable to us? Only lower cost of living. And that's, you, were, you know, that's the trade union uh, slogan. Mm -hmm. Cost of living should be kept down. Well, the answer of the industrialist is then you should have lower wages. Mm -hmm. okay. Otherwise, we can't do. Yeah. Oh, that's not the right answer. So, what will come out of that is the awareness of the politicians, and especially the Brussels politicians, that they cannot work only for, let's say, 10% of the population of Europe. Mm -hmm. The other 90% have their rights to be served by the EC. Mm -hmm. So, at the moment, they are trying out. Uh, a new additional policy, agricultural policy, for the middle large farms, for the so-called family farms. Mm -hmm. Have no personnel, but there's the father and the son and the mother all working on the farm, and uh, those farms should have a future. There's a two-person farm, at least, if not three-person farm, and uh, they need another type of, uh, of production, uh, other products, than the mass products, in fact, the industrial products of agriculture, like milk and uh, beef mm -hmm. and, some other, and some corn or, or mm -hmm. uh, cereals. Uh, that's basic for, uh, for our uh, economy, as a matter of fact, that we can uh, breed them within the EC as, as much as possible. We have to import uh, as well, but we can export part of it, so that's in balance. But there's a whole market of other agricultural products that could be produced and bred by the smaller farms. Yes. And now the EC is understanding. We have to organize that, and they have to stimulate it. And they say we should do it on the European level. That's quite nonsense. It should be done on the regional level. Uh -huh. yes. on the region. And what's it? Ireland is more than one region. It's more than one region. Yes, yes. there's the urban region of Dublin, and the urban region of Cork, and there are several rural regions. Mm -hmm. The western part in the Midlands, and perhaps the north, the northeast. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they should have their own possibilities. Mm -hmm. And that's the same in the other countries. Mm -hmm. But we need a new kind of regional movement within the EEC. Yes. Not nationally organized, but let us say at a lower level, but in connection with each other over the whole of Europe. Uh -huh. That's what we need. Differentiated by economic base. Uh, yes, I would like to say on a geographical base. The, okay. the, the, each region after its own natural and, what's more important, its human resources. Human resources, yes, yes, yes. Well, we're coming toward the end of our hour, I think, Professor Vandenberg, and I would like to ask you one last question. Uh, what were some of the biggest lessons you've learned from being involved in this very difficult area of planology? What have been some of the biggest lessons you've learned? Now, I think one of uh, the lessons that brought me into a crisis, a personal crisis, uh, one of the lessons I learned was that uh, the expertise of a planologist, a full-time planologist, and even a planologist who is, takes the time to think about what he's do doing and why he is doing it and at what purpose he is doing it, that his expertise is fully insufficient to get a well-managed environment for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, the only people who can do it in the right way are the people themselves. So the first lesson, and the, I, I, I accepted the lesson and I tried to make the best of it, is the democratization of physical planning as such, as an activity, mm -hmm. as an action. I think that's an, a second uh, experience uh, I can say in the same line is that now uh, uh, physical planning has become a matter of, uh, of politics. Mm -hmm. It's not only a policy, but it has become a matter of politics. Everybody understands that there's a problem of values behind mm -hmm. it. Mm. And what's interesting that, uh, first of all, we thought that the values of history that were behind. And I think that's one of the problems of Ireland. Mm -hmm. The main problem is not that are uh, the values of history, but the values of the future. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's one line, and history is unreal. Ah. Yes. 
Yes. Around, the other way around. Mm. Mm. It has to do with history. Yes. So the development of values and the, the creation of new values and the, well, the conception of new values, that's to say utopian thinking. <coughs> it's it's very important. Mm -hmm. Symbolic, yes, but also mm -hmm. very concrete. Mm -hmm. Because the man in the street doesn't understand a, a symbolic uh, utopian mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. he, he does want to know how much more money he will get, mm -hmm. how much more happiness he will have, how much more opportunities he will have will see for himself and for his, his children mm -hmm. and for his wife. Mm -hmm. And don't forget that at least half the population are female. Well, <coughs> that's not because you are a, a woman that I'm saying that, but mm -hmm. I'm impressed by, uh, by the capacity of the female population uh, to uh, do planning themselves. Perhaps. They can, are much better, I can say trained, but are better, better uh, equipped yes. as a person to realize physical planning at grassroots level than man. Well, it's strange. You're speaking to the converted, you know. Yes, perhaps mm -hmm. I am, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm a man, I can't yes. help it. Okay, yes. Well, thank you very much for this very interesting conversation. I think you've given us a few tips about what to do, what not to do, and uh, especially encouragement to take responsibility for doing it ourselves. Thank you very much, Professor Vandenberg. Thank you.